Hello, it's Scott Manley here. Today I want to talk to you about weapons grade stuff. Now the term weapons grade has entered into popular parlance to the extent that we are currently talking about weapons grade memes being deployed against Wall Street. Uh, I'm, I'm going to point out that you should not confuse this with military grade, which is a completely meaningless term generally added to Amazon listings to sell them to a certain type of person. No, weapons grade refers to weapons grade material needed to make nuclear weapons. And these basically set down constraints as to the isotope ratios for the material so that they can be used to easily build bombs. And you know, the reason why, of course, we're interested in this is you want to keep that kind of material under control to stop it, uh, to stop nuclear proliferation. Now, the origin of these terms, I believe, goes back to like the 1950s, where the US is starting to collaborate on nuclear uh, science with other nations, and they're looking at what level of uranium enrichment they can share. And there's this document that was published that figured out that you know, for research reactors, they shouldn't allow anything more than 20%. So 20% becomes the transition from low enriched uranium to highly enriched uranium. And weapons grade is like 80%. Yeah, depending upon the material, you've got different rules. For uranium, it's all about the isotopic ratio of uranium-235, which is the stuff that actually explodes and drives the chain reaction, and uranium-238, which sort of generally sits on the sidelines and doesn't do very much useful stuff. Now, in nature, you've only got 0.7% uranium-235 in regular uranium, and the rest is 99.3% uh, uranium-235. So it is possible to make a nuclear reactor using just this regular material, but you have to have a lot of moderators to slow down the neutrons and get them to pay attention to the 235 and stop all those 238s from getting in the way. But if you go through a process of enrichment where you exploit the very small differences in mass between these two atoms and uh, you enhance the concentration of the uranium-235, then your reaction gets easier and easier to make. Now, for the first atom bomb drop from a plane, that was a little boy, and it was made with material that was on average 80% enriched. I say on average because apparently large parts of it were 90% enriched, but there was some part which was only 50% enriched. Uh, and a lot of these details are uh, still somewhat classified. So it's, it's relatively easy to make an atom bomb if you have enough, uh, material, enough uranium at 80% concentration enrichment, right? As you get to lower and lower levels of enrichment, you need larger and larger critical masses. And like in theory, I believe you can make 20%, you know, low enriched uranium go off. The, the point is that you, you want to restrict these very high things from being available to the world and generally every, the st only stuff that's really kept around these days is highly enriched or regular enriched uranium. The highly enriched uranium is used in very limited number of cases, sometimes used in uh, submarine reactors, for example, where you want to get high power density uh, and the least amount of stuff getting in the way. Okay, so... Plutonium. Now, plutonium is actually what's used in most atom bombs these days. It's much better. It has a much lower critical mass. It's a lot harder to work with for various reasons, but it's generally become the thing of choice. Now, plutonium isn't a natural material. It's made in a reactor. It's actually made where you have a regular chain reaction going with uranium-235, and that uranium-238 that isn't doing anything useful, it will frequently absorb a neutron, that will increase the mass to 239 and then it'll undergo a series of radioactive decays and you'll get plutonium 239. So this is how they made the plutonium for the first atom bomb. They built these reactors that didn't produce power. They actually took power from the power grid, but they sustained this reaction and they were able to take the materials out, reprocess them, extract the plutonium, and that was the material that was used to make the Trinity device, which was the first atom bomb ever detonated, and of course later the Fat Man, which was dropped over Nagasaki. So, with plutonium, yeah, the 239 is the stuff that explodes, but as it turns out, the other isotopes pretty much all explode too. 
However, with uh, material in the reactor, it's not just plutonium-239 you get. You get other isotopes produced because you can't exactly control the series of reactions. Sometimes that 239 will absorb another neutron and it'll become plutonium-240. Sometimes there are other reactions that will produce plutonium-238, which is the stuff that is used in spacecraft for power generation. The problem is that both of these materials have drawbacks. The plutonium-240 is just as valid as a weapons material, but it will undergo spontaneous fission more often. And that means that it can trigger the reaction early. And I don't mean early as in when the bomb's just sitting around doing nothing. I mean that during the process of collapsing your material down into a critical mass, you want to squish it as small as possible. And it takes a finite amount of time to do that. But if you've got too much plutonium-240 there, it can actually trigger the reaction while you are still squeezing things down. And that means you never reach your peak density and the bomb explodes with less energy because it has less new density. So that's one problem. The, the plutonium-240, by the way, is the reason why they couldn't build a simple gun-type device where they, uh, you shoot one slug into another and that makes your critical mass. With that, they figured out the barrel needed to be way too long because plutonium's chance of pre-detonation was too high. So with weapons grade plutonium, you make sure there's no more than 6.5% plutonium-240. The 238, as I said, is used in spacecraft because it's radioactive and it generates a lot of heat. So having too much heat in the device that you want to use is prob a problem. It means you have to somehow get rid of that heat or it will damage components, damage your explosives. So weapons grade material has less than one half of a percent of plutonium-238 in there. So that's your thing, 93% uh, uh, plutonium-239 with 7% other stuff, that's weapons grade. But again, that's just what is easy to work with. As you get more and more other isotopes in there, it is still possible to build weapons. And in 1962, Britain was working with the US and they came along with some reactor grade material that had, uh, it's believed it was about 15% other isotopes and they used that to build a bomb uh, to demonstrate that it was possible. And it, yeah, it was a little weaker. I believe it was only about 10 kilotons, but this is all classified. The exact numbers here are totally classified. <laughs> and I'm just guessing here. So it is possible. I think there's another calculation I saw that said that going from like 5% other isotopes to 15% other isotopes cuts your weapon yield by a factor of 10 and then going from 15 to 25 cuts it by another factor of 10. But that's not to say that it's impossible, it just gets harder and your yields get lower. So the thing about making the plutonium in the reactor is that because you've got all these other side reactions, reactors are designed to make fuel or uh, fissile material for nuclear weapons will generally only keep the rods in the reactor for a couple of weeks and then take them out for reprocessing. But that, in many reactor designs, pressurized water designs, means shutting the entire reactor down, letting it cool down, and then taking the rods out. Whereas the reactors that were used to generate the plutonium for the first weapons, they had this sort of continuous flow system where you push the rods in at one end, it was, a, it was horizontal, and as you pushed it in, it pushed the rods out the back. So they could keep the fuel in the reactor for only a limited amount of time. When you have the fuel sitting in the reactor for years, it generates much, much more of these other reactants. And so the material is not considered weapons grade unless you can somehow remove these. So yeah, that's, that's again why you want to control reprocess nuclear material, but equally it becomes very hard to build an atom bomb because of the problems of pre-detonation and heat. Now, there is one other nuclear material that's worth mentioning, and that is uranium-233. That's another isotope of uranium that in many ways is actually better than uranium-235. You actually need a lower critical mass of uranium-233. So uranium-233 comes from thorium reactors. When thorium-232, uh, which is the most common isotope, absorbs a neutron, it transmutes into uranium-233, and then that's the stuff that actually undergoes fission in these reactors. And 
again, yeah, you can use this uh, in, in bombs. It was being tested. The US has tested a weapon. I believe India might have tested a weapon with this. The problem is that, again, it's a material produced in a reactor and you have other materials, other isotopes produced. And the one that's the biggest problem is uranium-232 that can result. And it, in its, on its own, it's fine, right? It'll actually undergo fission too. But it decays into a whole bunch of other decay products, which produce a lot of gamma rays. And so I believe anything more than about 50 parts per million of uranium-232 in your sample makes it very hard to work with because of the amount of gamma radiation. You have to move to like shielded glove box or remote manipulation rather than simply glove boxes. So this 50 parts per million requirement is really hard to achieve. And it's one of the reasons why thorium reactors are usually cited by their proponents as being a very low uh, proliferation risk. So yeah, that's, that's what weapons grade means. It's all about the isotope ratios of all these different materials. There's probably other fissile materials where the, the, the concept of weapons grade has been considered. You, you can make a bomb with neptunium, californium, americium, Americ I don't, never had to know how to pronounce that, but it's a, it's a thing that makes stuff explode. So yes, now, now you all know, weapons grade material, Make sure you've got your percentages laid out, otherwise you won't get the boom boom that you want. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.